Well, good morning or afternoon, depending on where you are, everyone. I'm Christian Napier, the co-host of the Teamwork, A Better Way podcast. Welcome, everybody, and a very, very warm welcome to the brains of the operation, Mr. Spencer Horn. Spencer, how are you? I am great, Christian. Good to be with you. It's been it's been a minute since I've uh, spent some time with you. Yeah, it's been a, it's been a minute. What have you been up to? How was your weekend? My, great. I, I spent the last eight days in Florida, so I was there for for business and pleasure. Went to Universal with my son and and uh, his wife. We uh, we spent two days at Universal. We we spent two days at a leadership retreat and some time on on the beach and just just enjoying the the Florida sunshine and rain and mosquitoes. What about you? I got to learn how to hit my mute button properly here. (laughs) I start talking and nobody's going to hear me. So while you were away, uh, we went for colder climbs. We we spent a weekend in Sun Valley and uh, up in the Sawtooth Mountains. And uh, that was absolutely fabulous. And then uh, last week, uh, we 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 left on Friday, came back last night. We went to uh, Minnesota and uh, up to Lake Superior. And I'd never been up to that part of the country before, and it was beautiful. It rained hard uh, at times, uh, high degree, uh, 59 degrees, you know, so oh like, you know, maybe 13 Celsius or something like that. But uh, yeah, very, very, very nice, uh, relaxing time at both those locations. So. Happy to be back with you, Spencer. Good. Uh, well, that sounds exciting. Did you get? I'm serious. I've got like 50 mosquito bites <laughs> from being out on a dinner cruise. I don't know how it happened. I was great until we went out on on uh, Sanibel Sanibel Harbor, right there by Sanibel Island, which I'd never been to. It was just absolutely beautiful. But um, uh, it, I never got. I, I got a few mosquito bites at Sun Valley up in the Sawtooth Mountains. Um, but uh, but in Michigan or uh, Minnesota, excuse me, uh, no. And primarily because I was wearing long sleeve stuff because it was cool outside. But I was wearing so, stuff too. And it was went, they went right through. The, anyway, we oh, got wow. a lot of stuff to talk about rather than mosquitoes. Yeah, we do. We do. We do. I'm excited for our topic. So are you present for our topic today, Spencer? I, I am present. I'm present and prepared. And I think that this is, uh, you know, something that is is a challenge for a lot of uh, managers and leaders today. Is sometimes people are having meetings and people aren't very present. That's right. And we, you know, occasionally we read something online, an article or something that we find interesting. We we share those with each other. And there was this interesting study that was GitHub and Catalog that uh, um, was looking at the phenomenon of digital presenteeism. And before we dive into it on some of the statistics, probably we should define what it means. Absolutely. What does it mean? Uh, what does presenteeism mean, Spencer? Well, I've always understood presenteeism that it, it's like you're there, but not really there. It is, you know, you're distracted from being totally focused and, and on board. I mean, here you and I are having a conversation and hopefully we have no other distractions so that we can have a, a productive and effective conversation. With presenteeism, you have people who are, are, are present physically, but maybe emotionally or mentally distracted. Yeah. And then, uh, and and we've seen that, uh, throughout our lives, right? We, this is, this is not a new phenomenon. We've seen people that have been kind of checked out, uh, mentally. And, and we've seen the evolution of that where, I don't know, maybe 10 years ago, we, 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 or maybe a little bit more when the smartphone, uh, became popular, people looking at their phones and meetings all the time, right? So there was a big hullabaloo about, well, if you come to a meeting, what do you do with your phone? You right. know? So people started putting in, well, you know, turn your phones on silent, turn them off or leave your phones out. Uh, so that people weren't distracted by looking at their phones. And now the next step in that evolution is people working from home and uh, doing kind of the same thing. They're there, but they're not there. 
And it's so easy, Christian, to be in a meeting. Like right now, I could pick up my phone and I could be surfing and looking at my social media, and you might not even notice it because I'd be, you know, looking down. Maybe you think I was taking notes. But even oh, what was that, Spencer? What were you saying? <laughs> exactly. That's exactly right. So we're distracted. In, in some families, even I know that as our family, we would say, all right, everyone, everyone put your cell phones in the basket. And, you know, kids would moan and groan, oh, no, you know, but so that we could just be together and have a conversation at dinner. The same thing that you're talking about in meetings is we need to be there. The challenge is, is some of those behavioral tendencies have carried over to the digital space. And in some cases, the 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 ethos of, of hard work or commitment and dedication, some companies wear that ethos, you know, like a badge of honor. Like, you know, we, we're all in all the time. I actually have a client that that's one of their core values, that they are just committed all the time and they do whatever it takes. They'll work day and night because they have clients all over the world and they actually need to be responsive 24-7. You're doing the same thing and having middle-of-the-night interviews, but sometimes that, you know, you need to find space for yourself to, to be off. All in all the time creates some some problems, and we have to deal with the challenges of life, and we can be distracted if we have to have this 80-hour, 100-hour, or even 60-hour work week mentality. If that's being now translated to the digital environment, we have some we have some problems, and I think that's what we want to talk about. And and for those of you who are listening that are saying, "Well, wait a minute," I you know I'm I'm in manufacturing, I'm in construction, I don't have people who work remotely or asynchronously. I have people that, we have people that, that have to be in person. Stay tuned. We want to talk to you as well. And if you're listening on LinkedIn or any other platform, tw- Twitter or, or Facebook, we want to hear from you. We want to have, we want to hear your stories. We want to hear your comments. We want to hear your questions. Um, and I know I just posted this last night, Christian, so we didn't get a lot of, uh, we didn't invite, uh, you know, a lot of folks to listen to that. So, but hopefully people will, will follow up and, and hear it afterwards. Oh, I certainly hope so. And I do think it's important for us to recognize, uh, as we've been discussing here, that this is, uh, these are new wrinkles in old clothing, <laughs> right? The, 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 there's, there's, there are undercurrents of bad habits that happened in old physical workplaces that are now happening in digital workplaces and divisions between the C-suite and the workers that happened in old uh, companies that are now happening in new ways in the in the digital environment. We're just seeing new manifestations of some deeper set challenges that have faced the you know workplace and the workforce for for a long time. Yeah. Well why don't you share some of the some of the the research or the, or the data on what's happening? All right. Well I'm gonna be looking at my phone here because that's where I got it open. But I'm not distracted, Spencer. I'm <laughs> I'm totally dialed so, in here. So okay, I, I got uh, it on my notes. I did I did it the old school way, which maybe is not a good idea because you know, printed it out on paper. All right. So here are some of the bullets. And I'm just quoting from this uh, article on catalog.com, and that's catalog with a Q. Uh, uh, and the the uh, the article is entitled Catalog and GitLab Study Reveals Pervasive Culture of Digital Presenteeism. And uh, the three highlighted bullets at the beginning of that article are, are quite interesting. Number one, uh, workers waste, and I think that word is an important word, waste an extra 67 minutes online each day due to quote unquote digital presenteeism pressures. In other words, um, they feel like they have to be online. They have to be present or people are going to think that they're not doing anything. So right. they've, they've got to go, they've just got to be there. Just so how does that be... show up? Describe how that, that behavior might be presenting itself. Well, what are the ways that we work online now? Uh, we have digital meetings online. We zoom calls. So what do we do? We, we, we get on the zoom call and then we mute our video and we may mute our audio and we may be doing other stuff while that stuff's going on right uh we have slack channels or other you know microsoft teams other tools that we use for collaboration in more real time and someone might ask a question that we might feel pressure to say oh well i'm part of the conversation so i will make some kind of remark just to let everybody know that i'm around and i'm paying attention 
And those may be what I call the, you know, standard social media kinds of remarks, like great job, well done, congrats, you know, a bunch agree. of emojis, right? I agree, you know, well said, you know, those, those kind of things. We're not really making necessarily a valuable contribution, but we feel pressure, like the, the, you know, okay, well, someone took the time, they, they, they posted something in here, I need to respond right away to what this person said to show that I am quote unquote present. Right. And that even goes for responding to texts and emails in a quote unquote timely manner that we feel pressure to do that though. Um, and, and part of that is because of this culture of having to be all in all the time, always, always responsive. And, and in a way, Christian, that is, we are creating in some of these organizations and, and it's according to research, most organizations have this type of culture where it's expected that that you're you're available, that you're in you know you're in the office, uh, or if you are online, that they're monitoring your activity, and and so we're actually rewarding this type of behavior in, in, because we're measuring activity or inputs versus output, which is productivity, right? Absolutely. And I, I've, I've been on that soapbox for a long time, Spencer, as you know, we really should right. be measuring outputs and we should be, we should be focused on outcomes and not so much on, on activity. Uh, the, they use a phrase in here, which I think is quite interesting in describing uh, or addressing digital presenteeism. And the phrase is asynchronous privilege. Where it, and, and, and again, as you mentioned, uh, this may not apply to all industries, but for uh, industry, specifically with knowledge workers or people who do things remotely or work out of an office, the idea of asynchronous privilege is that when a, when a request is received, I don't necessarily need to address or react to it right now. I can react to it later, and it's okay. And the challenge with asynchronous privilege is there's a pretty steep divide between the way the C-suite uh, behaves uh, and the way that everybody else behaves. So the second statistic that was interesting in this study was that 74% um, of C-suite executives are able to work on their own timetable compared to just 24% of junior staff. And how is so, that really different from even, even being in the office environment? I, I mean, I know so many C-suite executives that they get to come in after they work out or take care of their kids on their own schedule, whether that's 9 a.m. versus everyone else coming in at 8 a.m. Or that's, that's very, very similar where they're able to just because of their executive position, be able to have the flexibility to respond to life challenges that maybe the hourly staff or even the, the mid-level management doesn't have in terms of a, a, that same privilege. So that's what we mean by asynchronous privilege. That's right, Spencer. And as you rightly mentioned here, this isn't something that just happened because we went digital. These are, these are, these are, I don't know if trend is the right word, but they are practices that have existed in the workforce or behaviors or beliefs that have existed in the workforce for a long time. And uh, there's always been this divide between the way the C-suite behaves and the way that the rest of the company behaves. And this is the latest manifestation of it as now in the digital realm. And uh, so I think that one of the points that the authors of the study are trying to make is that we're bringing some of these bad habits from the old workplace into the new digital workplace. And so... Uh, you know, if we focus on solutions that I think are entirely digital, we probably won't actually solve the problem because the problem existed before then. And uh, this is just a new manifestation of it. And, and, and I think that's a really important point. I re so, so if you're listening to this, again, as I said in the beginning, if you have a work team that is not fully remote or even having hybrid because you have to be in person, those tendencies or or cultural norms, I think, is the word that, that might describe what we're talking about before the digital asynchronous uh, privilege issue we're talking about is what we need to address. And so we want to address it in, in, in both spheres, in the in the the digital asynchronous environment and in person. 
Absolutely, Spencer. And I think this other statistic is really important and it does not just apply to the digital workplace, but I think it applies to whatever your circumstances are. Uh, according to the study, an overwhelming majority, again, quoting the article here, 81% of the respondents believe that they are more productive and create high quality output when they have more flexibility over when they work. I don't think that's necessarily restricted to people working digitally or working remotely. I think that there's now a view that is, uh, for, for, you know, I could be a roofer, you know, uh, um, but if, but if my employer gives me some flexibility in my schedule, then the time that I am working, uh, I will be more productive and I will be more creative and I will get more done if I believe that I have some flexibility in my schedule. Right. I mean, I, I think that is problematic for some employers. You know, you, you mentioned a, a roofer. You know, if there's a schedule that we have to, to maintain, I know that, you know, I just spent the last weekend with a company that is a, uh, they build bridges and, and uh, steel structures and roadways. And they have, you know, they have a certain schedule that they, that they have to, they have to fill. But I think one of the ways to, to do that is on your teams to be able to have some flexibility and be able to, to schedule people in, in being a little more uh, proactive on your team's needs and, and plan ahead. Now, obviously, there's going to be emergencies that come from time to time, and we need to be able to, to manage those. But this isn't about working less. This is, this is about, again, keeping productivity high and having some flexibility, because as the research said, we're talking about qu high-quality output, when there is some flexibility. So it's, it's not about any fall off in terms of productivity and quality of work. It is just how do we manage the, the needs of our, of, of our team a, l a little bit better. One, one little nuance in this, Spencer, that I think is worth uh, pointing out. In this statistic, the way that it's phrased is that the majority of us believe we are more productive. Now, we may not actually be more productive, it's possible that we are less productive, and and this is, and this could be a reason for the disconnect between the C-suite and everybody else, is you know we believe ourselves that we are more productive. We may or may not be more productive. You know, chances are we are, but there's a chance that we are not more productive, but we think we are more productive. But I think there's an important psychological element here because people believe that they are more productive, then. I believe that the C-suite should use this to their advantage, right? And 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 uh, and gender a culture with some flexibility that gives people the belief that they are actually more productive because they think that they have a little bit more control over their schedule. You know, talking about these these businesses, like you mentioned, the the, the companies that build bridges. Well, we have a good friend that owns a landscaping business, and. And one thing that he did is he went from a five-day work week to a four-day work week. Right. So we're going to do four tents. Now, they get the same amount done in four days, you know, four 10-hour days, and they would in five eight-hour days. But what does this tell the employees? I got a three-day weekend, and I can use that to my advantage. You know, if I need to work another job, I can do that on that weekend. It gives me another day to work and earn extra income, or I can spend it on leisure kinds of activities. But... What he's done there is saying, okay, I value your time and I know what it is. I know how hard it is to, to you know, make ends meet and take care of everything. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you more time. And the way I'm going to do that is we're going to press our work week from five days to four days. You know, are, are his people any less productive? No. Uh, but do they feel like they have a little bit more flexibility because they have an extra day in the week that they can use for their own purposes? Yes. 
And, and I think so, that the thing that you mentioned that, that's really important is, is control. I mean, the, the, the reason why well-being is, is usually measured higher in, in the C-suite is because they have some control. They love what they're doing. They're, they're, in, you know, they're enjoying it, and they have that flexibility over their schedule. That, that extra just small bit of, of control over your life it, it can really add to overall well-being and engagement and has a, a proven positive impact on, on productivity. So there's a couple of things that I think are, are important. I, I have a, a, another client that is in the uh, completely in the, the digital marketing space, and they have a, a pretty unique model where you know they're working with advertisers, they're working with publishers of advertisements. And so there's this marrying of, okay, we've got a, we, we've got a, a, a vendor who wants to, um, who wants to uh, you know, put out a promotion, and then we've got to find publishers who will publish those, those promotions. And so we have sales people that are working with the advertisers and then sales people that are working with the publishers. And it's a very fast moving environment where you have to be extremely responsive. And it, again, it's a worldwide market. And so you've got people that are, are, are making inquiries 24 seven. And I know that some of the people on the team are, in some cases, getting three hours of, of sleep because they just want to be responsive because they're you know they're on on sales commissions and and so that that creates some some interesting challenges to uh, how do you how do you get someone in you know the younger generation that wants to live that way I mean some of the people that are that are managing those three hours of sleep are more our generation who you know, are, are used to working. Uh, and I'm not saying that people who are younger are not used to working. That's not what I'm saying. I'm, I'm just saying that it seems like that, that some of the, what we're seeing today is that that's more, that may be more common with, with certain, certain groups of people. And it's not, it, it's not very sustainable for every person in the company. And how do you train someone to bring them up to do that? And people are saying, you know, the young people are, are looking at that saying, I, I don't I want to live that way. I want to have flexibility and freedom in, in my life. So how would you manage, a, a, you know, an environment like that to to make sure that, you know, we take this idea of presenteeism and and and, and be able to, to manage that in a way that creates or sustains well-being? Well, that's a really great question, uh, Spencer, and and um, put you, on the you spot. are perfectly poised. <laughs> you are perfectly poised to answer this question because of the work that you do with organizations every day. I mean, you are you are there in the trenches with these leaders, um, helping address the challenges that that they face. Um, you know, I thought it was interesting in the article uh, or in the study that only one third of knowledge workers felt like they had control over their schedule. You know, they or they 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 had flexibility and they could work asynchronously and and um you know so again you know i i i focus heavily on the outcomes and you know this this digital presenteeism study uh you know is kind of based on the premise that people are wasting time right as a as a business leader as an owner can i really afford to have people quote unquote wasting their time you know what what is the benefit to me uh, from a from a financial standpoint or an operational standpoint, what is the benefit of digital presenteeism? There is no benefit to it, right? Here we've got people that are, are wasting quote unquote an average of five and a half hours a week. Five and a half uh, hours a week. Five and a half hours a week. I mean, you 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 do the math. If people are working a forty hour week, let's assume that they're working a four a forty hour week, you know. What is that? Twenty? Well, what's about fifteen percent? Fifteen percent of my, uh, you know, of of my payroll is going to support a practice of digital presenteeism. I mean, right. really? Right. You know, am I breaking down my payroll like that? Do I have a line item in my P and L that says, you know? allotment for time wasted, you know, that I'm taking 15% of my labor cost and throwing it in there. You know, if I'm looking at that, I'm like, well, what am I doing? You know, what am I, what am I encouraging here? I, uh, you know, the steps to, 
to to fix it, I guess, would vary based on, uh, you know, one organization. It, it, it will, but there, we're going to get to some some solutions here in just a minute. So hopefully we, we're creating a case that there's a problem. And I and I, let me let me throw one more wrinkle in this before we start to move on to solutions. So McKinsey has been tracking, um, you know, different statistics for, for years and years. And one of them that they've been focused on is just the, the, the challenges that women in the workforce uh, have. And what they have found, I mean, we have right now, uh, uh, burnout is at an all-time high. I mean, you know, we're talking about 28% of all workers are, are just are burned out. And, and, and that's understandable coming out of the pandemic and, and with all the turnover that we've had and people having to fill in for people that are gone and just, you know, just shorthanded this is something that's unique for it, not unique of, of any industry. Most people have been experiencing this. And, um, and, but what, what the research has shown is that there are some people and women especially feel a, a greater sense of responsibility and they are more often than not, they're, they're shouldering a greater portion of the burden of the stress in the, in, in the workplace. Meaning, if there, you know, if there's a shortage, they're they're picking up a, a, a voluntarily more of the slack. If there are individuals who are frustrated and burned out on the team, they're spending time to mentor and help and support them, on top of doing their own work, and they do this naturally, and then are not necessarily being rewarded extra for it. You take into account, in addition to that, that one in three women. And 60% of mothers with young children spend five or more hours a day on housework and caregiving. Think about all that they have to do on top of the regular work that they have to do. They are experiencing a disproportionate number, a level of burnout among all workers, almost twice as much as that 28%, about 42% of women are experiencing burnout. And so as as leaders of organizations, we want to retain our best talent. We want to we want to keep engagement high. We want to win the talent wars, even though you know business may be slowing down. We want to make sure that our best people, our hardest working, our most committed people, a lot of times that, that some of those women that we're talking about, are incentivized to to stay. So how do we do that? Well, I think there's 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 a couple of things that that we get to do. First of all. We need to have a culture in our businesses of of well being. We need to focus that, and we need to understand that we don't. So often, I think we separate the idea of well being and hard work. Right? We think, well, if we work too hard, we don't have well being. That's not true. What what the studies have shown, and, and Gallup has have just recently released some of this information, is that people who who love what they do, enjoy their work, they love the work environment, they feel like they they make an impact, have so much more well being, and, and they are, uh, you know, there's there's research says that that the quality of the work experience has two to five to three times the impact on their overall well being than just having time off. So this isn't about, hey, let's let them just work from home whenever they want. It's about creating a culture where, hey, we value hard work, but we also value some flexibility, some control in people's schedule. Like you were talking about our friend Patrick, who said, all right, let's go to four days so we can give, because our, our workers are telling us we want we want some time off to be able to do what we want, have some more freedom and flexibility, and and have uh, you know have some enjoyment in our life. But we're going to work hard. So people want to work hard. They want to they want to know that what they do matters. I told you I spent the weekend with um, a, a, a client. The company's name is is uh, Shelby Erectors, and they build bridges. And they are a company that has just really focused on. A culture of they've recognized that the average age of their superintendents is 53 years old. They're going to be retiring in the next 10 years. So who are the people that are coming in? It's it's the younger millennials. It's the Gen Z that they've got to attract. That figure out hey they can go work at a at a grocery store for 18 dollars an hour rather than work sweat hard sweaty work out in the Florida sun and rain. Uh, be, you know, breaking their backs and their entire bodies are, are in pain and because of the physicality of, of the work 
But part of the the message is, is, I mean, what's the value of bagging groceries? What do you get for that? Look at this beautiful structure that you are building, that you are adding to the community, to the infrastructure of, of society. And, and so they create this, this, this culture of, of, of pride of what it is that, that they're doing so that people really understand the, the, the value of their work. So I think one of the things that we need to do is be able to connect people to with what they do with how they're making the world a better place so they can feel the sense of pride in the work that they're doing. Secondly, you know, we did this, this, this retreat on a Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. They recognize that that's time away from family. So what they did is they invited everybody's family. Everybody that was involved in this, they said, you know what, we want you to bring your kids. And the opening dinner... On Wednesday night, there were kids running around, little kids. It was wonderful. So spouses were there. Children were there of all ages. They had uh, events and activities for for the kids to do while the employees were at the the training meetings. They had breaks that were half-hour breaks, so you could run up and check on your kids and see how they were doing. At all the dinners, we we did a dinner cruise. All the families were involved. Now, that means there's a little extra um, expense involved in that, but this company has extremely low turnover. We had everybody that was... I, I did this training for them a year ago. They had one new person on the team. That was in addition to the team last year. So very, very low turnover because they value the team they value the, the individuals on the team. They have, there was a, they recognized one of the superintendents who was uh, a, a, a Latin gentleman who his English is, was not great, but let me tell you what, he's one of the best superintendents that they have. And it doesn't matter where you're from, uh, you know, they recognize outputs. They recognize uh, a, a great work and, and also reward longevity. So they're creating a culture, Christian, I think, where, where we have this sense of well-being. The office staff is asynchronous. They do work remotely. Some of them work in, in, in other states, and they're able to, to do that. But those that, that work um, in person, they are rewarding them. They're letting them know how great their work is. They actually had, if you've ever seen that show, uh, what is the show, uh, uh, Dirty Jobs with Mike Rowe, they, uh, that show just came back online in January. The very first episode, January 2nd of 2022, was this company. They, they, they followed them and they watched them, all the steel work that they do. And it's just engendered this huge sense of pride in, in the employees in the, in the kind of work that they're doing. Uh, I have more, but I, just, I know I've been kind of monitor, uh, uh, hogging all the time. Comments? Feedback. Well, I have a question for you. Yeah. Um, and, and, the, and the question is... Uh, can you build this kind of culture? Can you build this sense of belonging in a remotely deployed workforce? You know, and 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 I think that's one of the things that's kind of driving the divide between the C-suite and the workers is the you know the the executives have a concern, and and I think the concern is a valid concern. It's just, which is how do we build this kind of culture that you're talking about uh, with with this cl- the client that you have? They build this fantastic culture. How do you do that? Uh, when your workforce is distributed and they're all working asynchronously, you know, flexible, their own their own uh, schedule. Uh, we've seen in the news just in the last couple of days, Malcolm Gladwell is the latest person to come out and say something and get roasted on on uh, social media uh, for what he said. You know about hey, you know how do you, you know how can you work remotely and feel like you have a sense of belonging. Yeah, which is but really it, interesting it, because he's been working remotely for the last uh, twenty years, so that's a little hypocritical. And which is yeah, something it, that people, yeah, and that's on. what people have been roasting him for, uh, you know, a lot right. is is that he's been doing remote work for a long time. But it does beg the question, you know, how do you establish that kind of a culture uh, where you have a culture of well being uh, in a workforce that is distributed uh, around the world that is asynchronous, where you know, as, as Malcolm Gladwell asked, you know, you know, is that really your purpose in life to get up and just, you know, take calls in your pajamas, you know, is, is this, or is there there, something, is there something more? 
You know, it's interesting. There, there is some value, especially to some of the younger generation. There is some value to being present with people who can mentor and and coach and guide you. The problem is, is that sometimes the older generation is not do, really good at at doing that. And so, I think one of the strategies that companies need to have is that they need to make sure that their managers are not just managers, but they're really good at coaching. So, you need to upskill your managers in in mentorship in being able to to be allies and and sponsor the younger generation that's coming in but so often what happens in in many environments is the senior people are are like hey you know the, the, these these kids today they don't have the work ethic we had when I was we had to sink or swim and and so they have this pride in how they struggled and that's just not working today and so we need to make sure that that we're upskilling our, our managers to, and it's not about coddling these kids. It's about helping them to navigate the, the new environment and to, you know, impart the knowledge and experience we have very quickly because as the workforce ages, um, you know, we, we, we're going to lose. And we've seen that over the last couple decades with the baby boomers retiring, we have lost a lot of institutional knowledge and that sometimes is gone forever. And, it, you know, we're not necessarily as, it, it, what's true, we're not necessarily as, as, as knowledgeable or skilled or experienced as some of the generations in, in the past, but that's on us for not passing that, that knowledge on. So part of what I think we need to do is make sure that we're upskilling our managers. That is your greatest point of, of development. If you're not spending time investing in developing the skills that your managers have in, in coaching and training and, and that's where you're you're losing more people or retaining more people is 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 because of that interaction that people are having with their direct manager um what's interesting we just got a uh, we just got a comment from Sasha how are you Sasha and let me see if i can uh add to the broadcast here here's what she says we are a remote company and are finding some employees don't love the new remote remote world as much as they thought. It, 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 that's not wrong, right? Especially the younger generation, because part of the the need is is to have a friend at work. We, we so often our generation thinks, well, you got to separate work and and personal life, and you can't do that because what happens at home impacts work, and what happens at work impacts your home, and so they they need a friend at at work. Um, Probably a lot to do with the missing culture piece that was there before. Certainly that is uh, true, Sasha, that, that we're seeing some of that. And so my answer to your question, Christian, is let me, let me share with you and my other client that I was talking about where people have to work 24-7. One of the things that they do really well, they have teams in Romania, they have teams in India, they have you know people in Puerto Rico, in Toronto, in Chicago. They're based in Nevada. Uh, Las Vegas is is the home office, and so you know they are used to remote working. They will bring their their key people into the office one week out of the month. You know, one of their their top VPs is headquartered in Puerto Rico, and so she is uh, she's in the office one week out of every month. Uh, that's just part of what they do. The rest of the time, she's working remotely or in in South America or on cruises with their with their clients and so there's a lot of fun and travel involved with that but they also have remote meetings and they will have lunch meetings where they're actually uh, ordering food for people just like they would in the office they're they're ordering you know f- food for people remotely so that they feel part of it sending it to their home having them part of that overall experience of of being in the office and and they're using tools remotely. There's some other things that, that you can do, I, I think, to reduce presenteeism. One of those is effectively manage meetings better. I think we're not prepared for meetings. We waste time in meetings. So we talk about presenteeism. We have two people speak up of the 10 people that are there. And so not monitoring people, uh, adding input to those meetings. And there's some technology that can help with that. There's Instead of taking notes, you can have... You can have your meetings recorded, and you can have uh, uh, things automatically scheduled. When we say, hey, "All right, we're going to follow up with this in two weeks," you, you know, you, you, uh, a memo is is put out that follows up, and so you can have some 
uh, some great technology that helps you to, to manage your meetings more effectively. But also recognize there's a cycle to meetings. You have to be prepared. Like when we come on this podcast, there's, there's preparation that goes into this. We don't just show up and start talking. We have to be prepared. And then after, you know, who's taking the notes and making sure that assignments are, are being done? We, 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 we're not doing meetings well. And so I think one of the things we need to, to get better at is managing our team, managing our direct reports. And that starts with developing your mid-level managers. And I think that that is as key. And, and spending time together. This this company that I'm explaining, they also do retreats. They do once a year. And we've done some great events together. And just spending time together. You, you're not always going to be together, but you've got to find some time to be together. That's the asynchronous part, right? You can't just be completely remote. There has to be some hybrid level of in-person connection. And that, that requires some investment. I mean, you've got to have plane fares and, and be face-to-face from time to time. It's just, it's necessary. Yeah, you know, just to kind of follow on that that last point, you know, I, I've been interviewing people from the IOC right. following the Tokyo and Beijing games. Right. And, uh, uh, you know, they were just like the rest of us thrust into a situation where they had to do all of their work remotely or a substantial amount of the work remotely right up until just before the games uh, began in Tokyo in 2021 and then Beijing in 2022. And there was a different way of working. And and one of the things that people lament is that they missed opportunities for the sidebar conversation, the conversation in the hallway, uh, the conversation at dinner, because those things weren't happening. We were having meetings that had agendas and that's great. They, you know, we did that in the physical realm, right? We would have meetings with agendas, but everything else that happened before and after the meeting, uh, we couldn't do or we weren't doing. And so it made it much more challenging to plan and deliver those games, uh, even though they were delivered and they were delivered really, really well. But it was hard for people to, to do that because they couldn't have that extra interaction that you're talking about. And coming back to your point on institutional knowledge, I think this is fascinating. And I'm going to get on my storytelling soapbox here. Uh, but but one of the things that we've missed out on, I think, in the digital transformation and working remotely is for the opportunities for managers and their subordinates or peers to share stories with each other. Because so much valuable knowledge and information is communicated through story. Uh, which becomes more difficult in a meeting. And oftentimes those stories happen in one-on-one settings when you're just sitting in your manager's office and you're having a conversation or you're going out for drinks after dinner and then story time starts and everybody starts telling the crazy stories. And, and, and inevitably somebody says, well, somebody should write the book on this, right? Because of all the stories that are being told. And we've missed out on a lot of those opportunities, I think, uh, since the pandemic started. Uh, you know, I was, I was quite interested. I, I, I saw a, a study that someone did of the top TED uh, um, TED Talks, you know. So you can go on YouTube or you go to TED, the TED Talk website and you can watch these TED Talks. So they're looking at the, at, the, at, at the top talks and analyzing the content of those. And 65% of the content of the top TED Talks are stories. And we have missed out, I think, on a great opportunity. And I think as part of that skilling up of your management team is giving them is is giving them opportunities to interact with their subordinates in these more informal ways where the real knowledge is shared. You know, uh, uh, so I, I think you're totally on, uh, you know, on top of this, Spencer and. And gosh, we could go. I'm just looking at the clock. I'm like, holy cow, 45 minutes have blown by. I can't believe how fast it's gone. We could just keep <laughs> talking about this topic. But, but you know, before we conclude, Spencer, what are the thoughts do you have about this topic of digital presenteeism, uh, the divide between the C-suite uh, and the workers, and the solutions that uh, are available to us to to make sure that uh, our people are as productive and as uh, happy as they possibly can be. We 
we've just been talking so much, I've forgotten all, all our bumpers to, to break things up. So I, I thought I'd throw that in there. Well, we have another comment, which I'll, I'll throw up in, in a minute. Here's, uh, so, so let me answer your question. I, I think there's a lot that we can do, and hopefully people have heard some of the things that, that we've talked about. A, uh, giving some control to your workers, developing your your managers and helping them to actually be coaches and mentors and and help them to sponsor the the you know the, the younger generation really put their arm around people um, it, it, it's hard because we're so busy and, and it's like man how do I have time to, to do that we, we must do that to win the culture war to keep the talent that we have and and we our people deserve our best. Uh, Clayton Christensen said the most, the, really, I, I'm, I'm trying to remember what he said, but he said the most honorable profession is is management. Why? Because you have the, we, we have the power to make someone's life so much better or so much worse. There is huge impact that our, our managers at all level have. I mean, so to, just to have people enjoy showing up or dread showing up, really it comes down to the quality of management, management that you have. So here's another, here's another way to increase well-being. Check in with your people. Have more discussions and not just, you know, hey, are you doing okay? It's like, know what's going on in their lives, know when they have things going on, uh, you know, serious issues, health issues, uh, crises, good things, marriages, be aware of what's happening. Understand the stress that your people are under. Now, here's a little bit of a plug for a tool that I use called the ProScan. I've talked a little bit about that. Use tools like that to measure when you take a, a pro scan regularly you you'll see what kind of pressure people are under there's good stress and then there's the bad stress right you stress versus distress and it measures that and sometimes what happens with well-being is that people are in a job that are not using their strengths to the best they possibly can so one of the ways to to keep well-being high is to look at the work that people are doing to make sure there's a good match with the strengths that they possess so that they're getting more energy and not being drained of their energy. You can actually measure that. And if there's something that you could have them doing that would, would give them that energy, then that would be something that I would really focus on. That that helps their, their energy stay high. And it also, you can use these tools in job planning. Like if you have a job opening, look at the staff that you have currently and their strengths and their skill sets and, and you can map for them, hey, there's an opportunity over here in this role versus what you're doing now. Is that something you'd be interested in? And, and really getting intentional about managing people's energy. So what we're talking about is giving some people some, some freedom so that they can improve their energies. And it's not about making it easier for people. Listen, people want to work. They want to know that the work that they do makes a difference. They want to they want to be contributors. So let's help them do that at a, at a high level. That's what I would say. And before we wrap up, I'm, I'm going to throw up, we've got Amy White, who is a, an MBA PMP, and she has this comment, um, was with a new team, with a new employer, and now I'm exiting due to not having earned political capital. I learned that it's difficult to earn the trust and capital remotely, especially with teams that have have had years of face-to-face -face trust built. So interesting, Amy, that, that you, you brought that up. I just had a conversation with a company in Cyprus, the country, uh, this morning. And I, I'm not going to name the, the company, but the issue was exactly that. I'm, I'm going to go do some training with them. And the focus is on communication and specifically the challenge that they're having with the ensconced or the senior or the seasoned staff and the new staff that is coming in that is just not feeling connected or or being mentored as I've been as I've been sharing with you and and so to your point Amy it's one of the things I said the newer generation they they're they're not disconnected from their work in their personal life right our generation was okay work is work home is home they they feel completely connected 
together. And so that's why they need friends. They need contacts. They, so that's why Mel- Malcolm Gradwell may have said what he said. We need to be in, in the office and not in our pajamas. But for our generation, I don't care. I mean, I could be in my underwear right now and it, it doesn't matter. I'm still motivated and working hard. I, I think he got that wrong. But there is some benefit to, to being together. And there is a way to do that, I think, remotely. And that is, we have to be more vigilant. We need to be reaching out to a new member like Amy who can contribute to our organization and spend time with her checking in. How are you feeling? What are you needing? And and being that person's ally and sponsor within the organization. And again, that is all about upskilling the managers that we have. I think that's a big theme from today, Christian. I hope that that answers your question. Oh, so much, so much. You know, there are some interesting digital tools that have come up uh, lately, like allow you to do like virtual aperos and things uh, after meetings so people can kind of gather in a more informal online setting. Right. Uh, but, but to do that intentionally, like you said, there, there aren't opportunities to have the meeting after the meeting. I think there are if you say, hey, you know, you and I, after we meet, like, hey, hang on the line and let's have a let, let's have a debrief. Right. That's we need to be doing that. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Um, so it's it's there, but people are not familiar with them or they don't know how to take advantage of them because we're still learning how to work in this new uh, paradigm. You know? well, so, l- let me say something else about Amy's comment, Christian. I'm sorry. I know we're going long. There are differences for minorities. There are differences with that women, like I said before, the McKinsey study, they have different challenges than a lot of the, the, the male workers. Not always. I mean, some of the men are caregivers as well. But f- by and large, most of the time, the women on our teams that are contributing so much have different challenges. And if it's you and I who are leading the organizations, we need to be extra vigilant that we are meeting the needs of everybody on our staff. You know, you may have someone, I, I just heard of a story of a, a, an Eastern Asian woman who was the only one on her team of 20 people, even meeting virtually, she was the only one and so had this keen sense of being the only one. There's a pressure that comes with that, Christian, that you and I don't understand. And it is, the pressure is, hey, if I speak up, I'm not just representing my company because we're like, hey, I don't see color, I don't see race, right? It's easy for us to say that. But it's, it's, it's not true for them because what happens is, is if I speak up, I'm representing my gender, I'm representing my race, I, I don't want to say something that will create false stereotypes. There's all this pressure that they feel that sometimes we don't even think about. And we just need to start thinking more about that and, and what we can do to help make their experience, their well-being a priority in our thought process. And that's going to increase their engagement their effort, their productivity. We'll solve so many more problems when we do that. Uh, I think that's well said, Spencer, and a fitting conclusion to our conversation today. Thank you so much for illuminating us and sharing all of your experiences. Uh, I always find your experiences to be fascinating, and I'm sure that your clients um, are really um, uh, benefiting uh, from from all of the work and experience that you're doing with them and you're really making uh, a difference, uh, not only for the companies, but for the people that uh, actually work for those companies. So Spencer, if people want to learn more about the work that you're doing, the great work that you're doing out there, uh, helping individuals and organizations, uh, what's the best way for them to get in touch with you? Gosh, you know, message me on LinkedIn. It's so interesting. Sasha just reached out to me and, and uh, I love that. Just uh, Spencer Horn on LinkedIn, you'll find me. Or go to our website, Altium Leadership. That's A L T I U M Leadership.com. And Christian, you know, you're coming with me to Cyprus this year and Lebanon. I'm so excited. We're going to be uh, together on the stage working with, uh, you know, helping people tell their stories and, and talk about how people can learn about how you can help them with capturing stories and, and, and really using the power of that within organizations. Well, thank you, Spencer. As you mentioned, uh, the workforce in many industries is aging, and now's the time to really start to to uh, transfer that knowledge and experience to the next generation of people. And you know, we're very honored to 
be a part of that cycle and, and to help uh, foster that cycle. If people want to learn more about that, uh, they're more than welcome to reach out to me at LinkedIn as well. Uh, just look up Christian Napier on LinkedIn and you'll find me. And also you can uh, go to our website, which is raconto, R-A-K-O-N-T-O dot I-O, raconto dot I-O, or email me at Christian at raconto dot I-O. All right, Spencer. Well, it's been a fantastic uh, 54 minutes. Oh my gosh. Uh, we're, we're setting <laughs> records here. <laughs> uh, but such a fascinating topic, and I really appreciate you taking the time out of your schedule. Listeners, likewise, we're grateful for you. And please like and subscribe to our podcast, and we'll catch you again soon.